Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. Time for us to get started. We have a couple announcements. Uh, Miss Olene is still not feeling well, so we can keep her in our prayers. Uh, Miss Kim is home following surgery and recovering, so we can continue to keep her in our prayers as she recovers. Charlene Cozy is at home recovering as well, so we can keep her and the family in our prayers. Uh, JD is weak at home following his last treatment, so uh, obviously keep him in, his, in our prayers as well as he is uh, dealing with that last treatment. Um, Marie Anderson's mom has a GI bleed, so if we can keep her in our prayers, and also Keith Anderson's uncle, Taft Anderson, fell and is, is dealing with a couple of things there, so if we can keep him, and as well as the Anderson family in general, in our prayers. Uh, there is a, lady day sign, a ladies' day sign-up sheet in the foyer. If there are any other announcements... We're going to wait one second. <laughs> if there are any other announcements, I'm missed. We will begin our worship and song. <clears throat> Last minute text saying, don't forget to put the offering in before Russ counts it. So that, sorry about that. <laughs> We're going to start today's uh, worship and song with Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye have not. Oh 
put their lives in peril to come to the service and help of others. And so we pray, Father, that you would keep them safe and that you would bless their families who deal with times of uncertainty and fear as those individuals are deployed or working their shifts. We pray for our missionaries, those who are working in very different situations than we find ourselves in, as we are oftentimes in relative comfort, some of our missionaries do not have the same level of comfort that we do. So we pray your blessing and success for each of those efforts that we support. And we pray as well for this church and the work that is done here. We pray that all that we do will be a positive reflection of our faith, be a positive reflection of the church and a positive reflection on our Lord and Savior. Help us to be reminded that where two or more are gathered, there you are in our presence. May we treat this time of worship with the dignity and the respect that it deserves. Again, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Next song will be Lord, we come before thee now. Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain. Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain?
memories as a child having to attend a lot of funerals, mainly because of all my mother's relatives. Something I always remember was when somebody died, she or somebody had to, well, they had to use a phone that used to hang on the wall, or maybe it was attached to a, a cord to a wall, and then they would have to dial numbers. And of course, they always hoped that either somebody answered the phone or the line you know, wasn't busy. And I remember when you used to go to the funeral home, the funeral parlor was filled with flowers from wall to wall. There would be just, just flowers. So to this day, when I see or I smell certain flowers, it just all remind me of. They're just, they're just dead flowers. People used to have picture frames. They had photo, photo albums. You know, the ones where all the pages would stick together. And at the service, you always had a preacher but as a child, back then, preachers did what preachers do when you heard a sermon and you felt like you'd been at, at church. So you fast forward to today, we still use phones. Because we had to call some people early in the morning you wanted to talk to them. But because of the time of day, the time of morning it was, you didn't have to say anything. Anyway, you were calling. So then later, you kind of wait till the sun comes up, and all you got to do is press send on your phone, and everybody knows. And nowadays, you still have flowers. But you also have, you have blankets and wind chimes and you've got items that say this is for this person to take home and then there's something somebody needs to plant. You still have picture frames. You still have photo albums, but they're a little different now. And now you have these large monitors or TV screens. Joshua and Jerry put together Two hundred pictures. So every eighteen minutes, you could either laugh or smile, or you could cry. As you saw Debbie's life play out before your eyes. We still have the preacher. The preachers now will speak from their heart, and oftentimes, family or friends will say something. Because today it's called a celebration of life. So here we are at the Lord's Supper. And I generally treat this like a funeral. Because someone has died. But not just someone, but Jesus Christ has died. And sometimes we'll sing, you know, sad songs. And the table out there has the words, remembrance on it. Today, I'm going to use the word celebrate. I'm sure in his day, the word of his death spread quickly. And we have some accounts of you know, people getting together. I think about just the common man. Surely some of them gathered somewhere. And if they were to celebrate, you know, what might they have said? Sure, you'd have the person that said, hey, we had a picnic planned one day. We had fish and we had bread. And Jesus took our meal and fed a whole bunch of people with it. There's somebody that would say, like, hey, remember the blind man? We touched him and he could see again. Somebody says, hey, you remember the guy that couldn't walk and he touched him and Jesus could walk, that that man could walk again. And they would just, people could just share, you know, miracles, things that they had witnessed. And I often think about the fact that, well, he was a carpenter. Don't you think maybe somebody said, 
hey, he fixed our door. He made us a chair. <coughs> And if we were to celebrate him, what could some of us say? I always remember Margaret Pittman saying, she loved the song, I come to the garden alone. Because she was a gardener and she had flowers and she always said she felt so close to him when she was out there. I've heard people say, I fall asleep every night in his arms. Or you might say, and he healed my mom, he healed my dad. I mean, there's, just, there's just so many things we could say is to celebrate. But he wanted us to celebrate him. And what he did not say was, hey, 2,000 years from now, y'all gonna be really busy. So one Lord's Day a month, set aside a time and celebrate. He didn't say that. He also didn't say, you know, y'all gonna have holidays, you're gonna have Christmas and Easter and Mother's Day, you're gonna have all these times where you got more people together, so celebrate me on those days. You know, he wanted us to celebrate him every Lord's Day. We remember him every day, but we celebrate him today. We've told everybody at our house, the clock on the wall meant absolutely nothing. And every day, when Debbie woke up, or during the day she fell asleep and she woke up and she thought it was the next day. Of all the things that she couldn't remember, and all the things that she had forgotten, she would always say, thank you, Jesus, for waking me up today. So I got a card the other day. It came from work, and you know how people at your work just, they sign cards, and they all say, oh, I'm sorry for your loss, or, for you. And the guy that I don't, don't even know very well, he simply signed his name and he wrote the abbreviation out beside it, Revelation 21 4, which says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither there shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away where I stand today that is reason for me to celebrate. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we do give thanks for this bread. And we celebrate the body of Jesus. We celebrate that he, he walked the path he didn't run away. He walked to the cross. So we give thanks in his name. Amen. Father in heaven, we give thanks for this cup. And we give thanks for the blood. And we celebrate that because of the blood, that you will wipe away the tears. And we give thanks that because of the blood, there is no more pain. And there's no more death. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord, we just give you thanks for everything, for all things. As we've heard this morning, there's a lot of people that are, are sick, and we pray for all of them. And we often just say, we give thanks for the help that we have. I give thanks that if we're able to walk and to run and to play, we give thanks for that. I give thanks that if we're able to hear, even if we need aids or something to help us, I give thanks that we can hear. And if we're able to see out of both of our eyes, I give thanks that we can see, even if we have contacts or glasses or surgery, thank you for the for sights and sounds. I give thanks that we have money. I give thanks if we're able to work or we've planned and we have money for retirement. How we have it, we give thanks for money. And we pray that we'll we'll give of that. We'll keep the lights on here. Just thank you for everything, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our next song will be Oh to Be Like. Sunshine in my soul, 
Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask. Now, in order for us to pray like Jesus, there are three things about the prayers of Jesus that we need to study. First of all, we need to study the emphasis that Jesus put on prayer. That is to say, what He said about it. We also need to study the essence of Jesus' prayers. That is to say, what He prayed. And then we need to study the example that Jesus set. What is it that He did about prayer? And so, as we look at these things, we are going to realize that in order to pray like Jesus, we must first of all learn to respect God as the giver of life. In Matthew 11, beginning in verse 25, Jesus prayed this, I praise You, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that You have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, but have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in Your sight. In Luke 11, beginning in verse 1, we read this, It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after He had finished, that one of His disciples said to Him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught His disciples. And He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be Your name, Your kingdom come. In Luke 6, 9, Jesus said this, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to destroy it? And then one final verse, Luke 18, beginning in verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you that this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And, and so we need to respect God as the giver of life. Jesus said that He is the Lord of heaven and of earth. And Jesus, in His prayers, wanted God to be glorified. Hallowed be Your name. Jesus spoke of the importance of doing good on the Sabbath. Even though you are not supposed to work, we are to do good on the Sabbath. That is to say that we ought to not only respect God as the giver of life, but we ought to respect the life that God gives. And the way that we do that is being humble in our prayers. We acknowledge the greatness of God, and we acknowledge our standing in light of Him. We need to understand that prayer is not a casual conversation. Even though I can talk to God about the casual happenings of my life. And it is perfectly fine to be casual, but we need to understand that prayer is not a casual conversation. We are entering into the great throne room of God. The great throne room of the Creator and Sustainer of the universe. And it is imperative that we treat that individual, that we treat God with the honor and respect that is due Him. So if we're going to pray like Jesus, we're going to have to recognize and respect God as the giver and sustainer of life. If we're going to pray like Jesus, we're going to have to learn to trust in God for all the dilemmas of life. In Matthew 14, verse 19, we read this. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up towards heaven, he blessed the food, and breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. 
I find it interesting that many of us will trust God for the circumstances or the things in life that we cannot control, but we do not trust God for the things that we can control. We will send emails and texts and posts on social media and have special prayers in worship when a diagnosis of cancer occurs because that is a disease that is hit or miss in terms of our success rate in treating it. And yet, we don't put the same emphasis for an individual who is undergoing cataract surgery. Both individuals may be facing surgeries, but we will trust God with those things that we perceive that we cannot control, but we won't trust God with the things that we can control. It's like we are only going to trust God when we have to. We're only going to trust God when we have no other option to do so. And that is not what the Word of God calls us to do. The Word of God calls us to cast all of our anxiety on Him because He cares for you. And, and many of us, we are living a burdened life because we are unwilling to give God not only those things that we cannot control, but also those things that we can control. And so we have all of these burdens on our back, and it's only when our back is about to break that we will then turn to God and say, okay, God, I now need you to take this. And He tells us that He will take all of our anxiety. He will take all of our burden. And so if we're going to pray like Jesus, we are going to have to learn to trust God for all the dilemmas in our lives, not just the ones that we think that we are incapable of controlling. Jesus knew the power that He had. Jesus did not have to pray to perform a miracle. He did not always pray when He performed a miracle. But here, with the feeding of the 5,000, He prays, and only once He blessed the food did He begin to break the bread and pass the bread out. Jesus had no need to pray this prayer at this time to perform this miracle. But He did it nonetheless. So we need to learn to trust God in all the dilemmas of life, not just those ones that are too big for us to deal with on our own. Now, this one kind of deals with trusting in God in the bad times. Uh, point number next is relying on God in the good times. We need to rely on God in the good times. I think one of the biggest challenges in terms of preaching the gospel in 21st century America is we have no need. We have no concept of us having needs. We have homes that are bigger than we need them to be. Now, I'm not criticizing that. I'm just acknowledging a reality, right? Uh, my grandparents raised six kids in a smaller house than what I live in. They carted six children around in a vehicle smaller than I drive. And we are blessed with abundance. We are blessed with abundance. And here's how much abundance I'm talking about here. I have a chest freezer in my garage. I have a full-size refrigerator in the kitchen. I have a dorm fridge in my Kentucky room because I don't want to have to walk downstairs to get me a Diet Coke or a bottle of water. And I have a dorm fridge in the garage so I don't have to go in the house to get a bottle of water when I'm mowing the yard. Okay? Angie comes up to me last night and says, the refrigerator is full of food and I still have these leftovers. Is there room in the dorm fridge in the garage? Right? This is the type of abundance that we're talking about. Ample food, ample food, and you know what I'm doing after lunch or after worship today? I'm going out to eat. 
with my song leader and others. And, and so this is the type of abundance, and this is where I believe it is difficult to preach the gospel in America in the 21st century. We have this concept that we have no need. And guess what? We did it ourselves. We did it ourselves. We worked or are working. Uh, we have money, as, as Terry was thankful to God for during the Thanksgiving prayer just a few minutes ago. You know where the gospel is thriving? In places where people have nothing. Because they understand their need. They understand their need. The church has always prospered under difficulty. Always prospered under persecution. But if we are going to pray like Jesus, then we are going to have to learn to rely on God in the good times. Let's go back to the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus has fed 5,000 people. Jesus has fed 5,000 people. Now, we've never had to feed 5,000 people here, but you know what we have had to do? We have had to feed people, right? And, and I know that you've experienced this with me. People are here, and, and we have food that has been prepared, and there's always enough. There's always more than enough. I don't know how many baskets we've always collected afterwards, but I know that there's always been enough, right? And, and it is always so gratifying when, when everyone has eaten, and of course the fellowship, that's always good. People are laughing, and then there's food that is left over. That's a high moment, right? That's a high moment. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. I think that's a high moment for Jesus as well. Do you know what the very next thing Jesus does is? The very next thing, after the feeding of the 5,000, I'm going to read the verse to you. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. Jesus is in the middle of a high moment in his life. What is his reaction? Prayer. Uh, Jesus has healed a demon-possessed boy. The very next verse. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a secluded place and was praying there. I think that the reason that we need to pray in the good times, we need to pray on those high moments in our lives, is because it's in those moments that we can be most susceptible to temptation. We can begin to think that we did it ourselves. We didn't do it in the power of God. We did it on our own. Or it may just be that in the good times, we may have a tendency to forget God. Even in good times, we should pray. Jesus said this in Mark 13, Take heed, keep on the alert. You do not know when the appointed time is. And the way to prepare for the crisis is prior to the crisis. This applies not only to the physical world, but to the spiritual world as well. We need to learn to lean on God for help with the decisions of life. In Luke 6, verse 12, it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them whom he named apostles. What did Jesus do before he made this big decision? He spent the night in prayer. He was God. He knew all things. He knows all things. He doesn't need guidance picking out his 12 apostles. Or does he? We need to learn to look to God for help with the decisions that we have to face in life. We need to learn to ask God for the needs of life. This is one that we may do better than others sometimes, but we need to learn to ask God for the needs in life. Luke 11, beginning in verse 9. I ask you, or excuse me, I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door is open. Now suppose one of your fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... 
How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? A few chapters later in Luke 18, Jesus said this, Now He was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God nor respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even if I do not fear God or respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. And so we need to ask God for the needs that we have in life. We need to learn to thank God for the blessings of life. This is one that we have a tendency to do fairly well at. In Matthew 15, verse 36, this was just after Jesus had fed the 4,000. We got two mass feedings in Scripture. Uh, the first was the feeding of the 5,000. The second was the feeding of the 4,000. And after the feeding of the 4,000, the Word of God tells us, He took the seven loaves and the seven and the fish, and giving thanks, He broke them and started giving them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. And so he gave thanks in this instance. Now, you might think that those are similar, and to a certain extent they are. But remember, with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus blessed the bread. Here, Jesus gave thanks for the bread. And so that's a subtle distinction, but it's one that I do want us to make. We not only need to thank God uh, for uh, the uh, guidance that we need, the dilemmas that we face in life, but... Be sure to thank God for the blessings that He provides for us. We need to learn to thank God for His plan. We need to obey God's plan for how we are to treat others in life. Well, how are we supposed to treat others? Well, first of all, uh, as it relates to treating others, I would say be weird. And I don't mean that in the strange sense of the word. I mean that in the counter-cultural sense of the word. Uh, and, and here's the verse. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. That's weird. Um, in the counter-cultural sense of the word. Because if someone curses you, our gut reaction is to curse them back. We might be more Christian about it. Bless their hearts. But that is human nature. A tit for tat type of thing. Pray for those who mistreat you. Generally, if someone mistreats me, I'm going to ignore, avoid, certainly not pray for them. Right? But that's what the Word of God calls us to. And, and so we need to obey God's plan for our lives and, and how we should treat others in our lives. We also should be forgiving of others. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will forgive you your transgressions. We need to talk to God about our enemies, not others. We need to talk to God about our enemies, not others. Do you remember the show Hee Haw? Most of us are probably old enough to remember the show Hee Haw, a variety show. And, and there was a group of, of women, and, and occasionally they would be a part of this variety show, and they were the town gossips. And do you remember the song that they would sing before they started gossiping? Now, we're not really ones to go around spreading rumors. No, really, we're just not the gossiping kind. Oh, you'll never hear one of us repeating gossip. So you better be sure and listen close the first time. Right? Well, the Word of God tells us that we need to talk to God about our enemies, not others. Therefore, do not associate with the gossip, the proverb writer said in Proverbs 20. Paul's concern for the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12 was, he says, I was afraid that perhaps I would come and find you not to be what I wish. And I may find you to be riddled with strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanderings, gossips, arrogance, disturbances. If we're going to talk about a problem, then we better be willing to talk to the person involved and be willing to do something about it. A sign of a dead faith 
is gossip. James 2, verse 15. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Therefore, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. To pray like Jesus, we're going to have to be honest with God about the issues of life. In Matthew 27, verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, there's a lot of debate about whether or not God really forsook the Son or not. And that is a much bigger debate than is within the scope of this lesson. But the point is, whether you want to argue that God actually forsook the Son, or that's just how Jesus was feeling in the moment, my point remains. Jesus was honest with God about the issues of His life. Whether God really had forsaken Him, or if that's just His mental state at the moment, Jesus was honest about what was going on in His life even as He hung there on the cross. And so if we're going to pray like Jesus, we're going to have to learn to be honest with God about the issues that we are facing in our lives. And guess what? He's willing to hear them. Cast all your anxiety on me, for I care for you. And then finally this morning, if we want to pray like Jesus, we're going to have to learn to trust God's laws in the temptations of life. Do we, by the way in which we treat one another in the church... Do we, by making the church a glorified social club, do we, by tending to the things other than worship and thereby desecrate worship, learn to trust God and His laws? <clears throat> Excuse me. In Mark 11, verse 17, the Word of God says, And He began to teach <clears throat> and say to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it into a robber's den. We need to trust in God's laws during the temptations of life so that as we come to worship, we are treating the, this moment, this time, with the reverence that it deserves. And also pray that we avoid temptation. Jesus, when they had arrived at Gethsemane, said to His disciples, pray that you do not enter into temptation. And then He withdrew, withdrew a stone's throw and began Himself to pray. Nine things that we need to be aware of. Nine things that we need to learn. Nine things that we need to do if we want to be praying like Jesus prayed. And so the question that comes to us this morning is, how are you praying? And one of the things that we are to do is to pray without ceasing. There's a misconception about salvation that many in people have. And that misconception is that prayer has anything to do with God's plan of salvation. Prayer has nothing to do with God's plan of salvation. The Word of God tells us that we must repent of our sins, confess Jesus as the Christ, and have our sins washed away through baptism. Prayer is not about salvation. Prayer is about relationship. It is about relationship with God. It is about learning to trust in Him for all the issues of life and casting those cares, those anxieties on Him because He cares for you. And so this morning, if you are not a Christian, prayer is not the solution to your problem. Believe and be baptized, as Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, is the solution to your problem. And maybe your prayer life isn't what you think it ought to be. Maybe you are somewhat dissatisfied with your prayer life. Well, hopefully this lesson on praying like Jesus can help to transform your prayer life. And if you would like for us to pray with you and for you this morning, then we would be happy to do so. If you are subject to the Lord's invitation this morning, Jesus invites you. And we stand and sing to encourage you. Bring Christ your broken life so marred by sin. He will create a new make all again your empty wasted years he will restore and your iniquities remember 
for coming out and worshiping with us this morning. If you're visiting, you're a welcome guest. We invite you back on Wednesday night. Uh, our closing song today is going to be uh, I Found a Friend of Jesus or The Lily of the Valley, whatever you want to call it. If there are no other announcements after this song, we will have our closing prayer. <coughs> I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me, he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul, the lily of the valley, in him alone I see, all I need to cleanse and make me fully whole, in sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay, he tells me every care of me.